Good morning and a warm welcome to today's Southwest Marine Ecosystem webinar hosted by the Marine Biological Association. I'm Alex Banks coming to you from pretty grey Exeter. Today's session is one of 11 themed virtual events replacing an annual meeting that has traditionally been held in Plymouth to share the year's marine ecosystem observations and events. The Southwest Marine Ecosystem Organising Committee would like to acknowledge the fantastic support of the MBA, Exeter University and Plymouth University for supporting and hosting these webinars. In today's session, we will be discussing coastal and marine birds. The schedule will be an update on the seabird census from Daisy Burnell of the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, presentation of research on oyster capture tracking on the ex-estuary from Joe Morton of Exeter University, presentation of research on Balearic shearwaters from myself and Jesse Phillips of Oxford University, and finally a regional roundup of information from across the southwest in 2020 led by Mark Grantham of the Cornwall Birdwatching and Preservation Society. Alongside these sessions we're pulling together information for the 2020 SWME State of the Southwest Seas report. So as you listen today, please share any 2020 marine observation highlights of your own. You can do this by posting details and links into the chat box or sharing with the details shared on the weekly webinar updates emails. We're hoping to finish by one o'clock today, but if we overrun and you need to leave, please just do so. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. For safeguarding reasons and to avoid disruptions, We've disabled your cameras and these will be off by default throughout. We will be recording this talk and a link will be shared on the Southwest Marine Ecosystems website. If you'd like your contribution to remain anonymous, please change your name through Zoom and you can also edit your name to share your affiliations if you wish. Please ask your questions using the Q&A function. The event moderator will read these to the speaker or provide answers through the Q&A function. And please use the upvote function or add responses and comments to other people's questions if you feel qualified to do so. Any general comments or observations will be safe for the record but cleared from the Q&A box by admin as we go along. Please use the chat function to share observations, links and information. We will save a transcript for our record. If you would like to ask a question in person, please raise your hand and we will activate your microphone but not your camera. If you do this, we will refer to you by the name you have used to identify yourself in Zoom. Please be aware that these interactions will also be recorded and shared publicly. Whilst we will do our best to field all questions, we have a limited time, so we may not be able to field all of them. And finally, if you have any technical issues, please message MBA event moderator using the chat function. So without further ado, we will start proceedings by handing over to Daisy Burnell from JNCC. Over to you, Daisy. Hello everyone, I will just share my screen for you now, once I can find it. Fabulous, hopefully everyone can see that. So um, thank you for the introduction, Alex. I. I'm from JNCC, uh, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, for those of you who haven't heard of us, because let's face it, we're a little bit small and it's not usual. Um, we are an arm's length government advisory body for the UK and the devolved governments on conservation uh, projects and, and advice. Um, and part of my role uh, within JNCC is to project co coordinate the seabirds count census which is the fourth breeding seabird census for Britain and Ireland so a great project to be working on um, although rather ranging and large at times but it's been really interesting and we are finally in the final year we did have a hiatus as I'm sure you're all aware due to the global pandemic uh, last year so all fingers and toes crossed that this season goes ahead so without further ado, I'll give you a little bit of background and history into what breeding seabird censuses are in the UK and, and uh, Britain and Ireland. So seabirds count is the fourth, um, but it all started off in around 1969, 1970, where the then seabird group uh, conducted their first ever uh, census. It focused mainly in the coastal areas and not all uh, species were included in that. 
Moving on to the second was Seabird Colony Register or SCR. I will refer to it as SCR because it is an absolute mouthful. Um, so in that, 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 that started in 1985 and went on to 1988 um, with newly developed methods that meant we could get better or more accurate counts of species like uh, razorbills and guillemots and were actually used as the baseline for most of our species for our annual monitoring. Then came along CEBA 2000, which was from 1998 to 2002. And this, I'm lucky to work with two of those uh, who were part of the project last time, which may, means I get to pick their brains quite a bit whenever I need any assistance, um, if they can remember it. This really improved, they improved coverage massively in this census. So we had uh, not only inland population surveys, but also uh, we attempted some urban uh, population censuses uh, and for the first time ever we got population estimates for the petrels and shearwaters which are quite a difficult uh, sub uh, species to to get numbers for so a really impressive uh, bit of work on that census all the while from around 1986 and to present day we have uh, the seabird monitoring program or smp and that collects annual um, counts from a sample of sites across the uk so they run it in parallel with each other and complement each other in certain ways um, and, and are useful in terms of, of having both sets of data to work with and understand and then comes the fourth one, the one that I've been involved with, and I've been involved since 2017, but as you can see, it has it did get launched in 2015. And our final year was meant to be last year, as I've said, but we have since been extending it to the 2021 season. And hopefully this will be our final one um, and we could get some results out to people, especially those who've been involved. And those who have been involved, uh, the CEBA monitoring program, as it's an extension of our annual monitoring program, the partners that sit on that 19 organisations in total, um, led by Jane CC, uh, are, are part of the, the steering group that focuses on how we go about getting these data and producing this project. Obviously, all of these have a similar, have a a similar goal in terms of understanding and monitoring our SIBA populations and making sure that conservation efforts are useful. So it does what it says on the tin. It's a set breeding census of all 25 species in the UK. I know full well that not all 25 species are on this slide. Trust me, it takes forever to cut these photos out and put them onto a PowerPoint. Um, and logistically, it's quite a challenge. We've got uh, some species like the black guillemot just down at the bottom there that have to be surveyed at a different time to all the others. Um, and the petrels and shearwaters tend to like to stick to the offshore islands that are a little bit more difficult to get to and cause a headache for those trying to organize surveys there. But it is all worth it in the end. Additionally, we have different methods and different survey units for these species. so. Uh, they can cause quite the confusion, depending on how you're going about counting them. And we have to consider all of this um, on a scale that's actually quite impressive. You know, we have an internationally important numbers of seabirds, and that's mainly because we're an island with lots of seabird uh, potential nesting areas. So at the moment, um, at the start of the census, we had around 10,000 uh, known colonies that we needed to pick up. Since then, that has grown. Um, once people know that a survey is going ahead, you get new sites coming out of the woodwork. So I think we are now at around 13,000 colonies uh, registered on our database. So quite, quite the challenge. And why on earth do we do all this if it's so difficult? Well, obviously there are lots of pressures and we know there are lots of pressures uh, on our seabird populations. And one of the big, kind of tools that can be used for for conservation measures is long-term data sets and we're really lucky with the census here in, in Britain and Ireland that we have that so we can ask questions like are plastics having an impact you know invasive species are these a problem for certain 
seabirds, climate change, obviously one of the biggest ones at the moment, our fishing practices affecting our populations. And the newest one coming into ours is, is um, offshore industry, especially marine renewables. And, and having this long-term data set not only means that we can ask what's happened in the five decades prior to this census and, and how it how are birds coping but also giving us a baseline for future events and future pressures that might be in place and the data is is used um across across various different uh, platforms um 106 spas have at least one seabird feature in the uk 36 of these were um, allocated after scr and a further nine from seabird 2000 data and they also feed into many different types of research. So everything from species specific um, variation, even to understanding uh, where risks of H5N1 avian influenza might turn up. So real wide ranging, and that's, that's because all of our data is open access. So if you ever want any data, please do ask us. And I guess it's no surprise that our seabirds are declining at 21 and some in particular are doing worse than others. Arctic skewer since between 2000, year 2000 and 2018 has seen a 70% drop, 80% uh, drop if you were to go back to 1986. And you can't talk about declines without talking about kitty wake. So these have declined by around 65% since, the last, uh, since uh, 1986. And of the 14 species that we can survey annually, around half of these are in decline just now. And actually the one, two that are highlighted here in orange, the so sandwich tern and roseate tern are actually coming back from really large declines uh, between the last two censuses. And in fact, roseate tern for the UK um, still isn't at its peak, which was in 1969, where we had around 955 occupied nests um, and compare that to 2018 where we had 120. We've still got a long way to go even if the upward trajectory is looking good. And how do we do it? Well, lots of volunteers, some that are actually panelists today and I'm sure some of them that are in the audience across Merlins, cliffs and uh, across our cityscapes. So how is it looking for you guys? I'll try and get through these as soon as I can. So your black-headed gulls, um, just as a little caveat, these are not official statistics. They are stuff that I've done um, very quickly for you guys because I wanted to give you some numbers. And they are only for sites where I've got comparable data. So where I've got a census, census data from both CBA 2000 and this census. Um, and these have actually been really positive for me. I do these talks in Scotland and I can assure you that a lot of these are downward arrows or red. Um, so really positive for me, even the ones that um, don't necessarily look positive uh, compared to Scotland, you guys are doing really well with your seabirds. So a 52% increase for your black headed gulls, um, a 3% decrease across 260 sites for your herring gulls, um, this is actually quite a good number compared to some of the Scottish uh, colonies that we've got. Um, Black-headed gulls, for example, in northeast Scotland, where I am coming from today, are down by 95% from our comparable sites. So it just goes to show how how nice and how different the uh, the populations are faring across the UK and, and England. My favourite, not that anyone should have seen the bias towards fulmers today. <laughs> um, they're down only 1% uh, in the southwest. Again, this is a really interesting uh, difference compared to what I've seen in Scotland, um, especially in your counterparts, so northwest Scotland, where we've seen major declines. Um, so it's nice to see something that's actually very stable, which is why it's in orange. We see a 1% easily on an annual basis. Your kitty wakes, again, not great in terms of trajectory, but actually on the whole, a 9% decline is much lower than what we're seeing in other sites. Two diving species for you, cormorant and shag. These two have got similar declines in your area. Um, 
uh, and this is actually quite indicative of stuff that's going on elsewhere in the country and in a, a theorizing here in, in terms of where that's coming from and presuming likely the uh, climate and weather patterns in the winter, but we'll see where that goes in terms of research. And to end on a good note, uh, your razor bills are up a staggering 140%, which is an incredible increase uh, in the last uh, two decades or so, along with a 165% increase in your guillemot. So an, an incredible uh, look at these. And, and again, looking at the Northeast, uh, this isn't the case. So it's nice to see some positivity in the numbers. Um, and that's all I've got for you today, but please do uh, keep on top of what we're doing in JNCC and in the census. And we do have some sites that do need surveying in your area still. So if you are keen to get involved and would like to help out this year, we're waiting on sign off for volunteer surveys to go ahead, but do get in contact, the email's there or phone, and I can try and get some sites covered for, for you. And that's it. Thank you to all the volunteers and to the country agencies and everyone involved. And hopefully you've got some questions. Thank you very much, Daisy. That was really interesting. Um, Jack, I don't know if we have got any questions for Daisy. I've got one, if not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question, Daisy, is around that increase you showed in Razor Bill and Guillemot. Do you have a feel for whether that is increases at sites those species are already breeding at, or is that any kind of range expansion? Okay, so um, the sites are ones where I so these don't include new sites. Okay, so these sorry. are purely so these are purely um, from sites where we've had data before, which is interesting enough because I do believe that there are new sites that have popped up for these species in your area. So, yeah, it's um, yeah, really really interesting to see those numbers. Um, and, and really, really uh, positive for me because I do end up having just to, to tell grim stats to people up here. So, yeah. Um, we've got a related question from Terry Khan. Amazing increase in orcs, but is this a recovery from losses in the 80s? Really good question. We did have some um, and I've I've not unfortunately not been able to have time to really kind of nitpick and, and dig into these numbers. Um, and, and that's something that we will do as part of the census write up. So the census uh, publication of results will look across all of the uh, four censuses, hopefully, and, and see what the trend is for those species. Um, but unfortunately, I've not been able to look at them for these ones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question from Lila Buckingham. Hi, Lila. Why do you think there is such a big difference in population trends between the Southwest and Scotland? Again, really good question. I'm sure that there is a lot of research. I mean, I know that there's a lot of research in the academic sphere at the moment around um, what the, you know, the differing fates. And again, that's something that we'll look at as part of the census write up. Um, it's, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. Everyone thinks that everything moves north um, with climate change, especially, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. And, and I wouldn't want to speculate at this point, especially with how differing fates there are even distributionally and, and even between colonies we're seeing uh, different kind of traje trajectories so um it's a question that i will look forward to looking into once i finally get the opportunity to look at the data properly but um yeah keep your ear to the floor on this because we will be um we'll be bringing out those kind of questions no doubt and and exploring those for the census re results right up Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, your work has just begun. The data are now in, you need to do something with them. Yes. <laughs> um, we've got one more question from Robin Shrubsoul. Could any of the figures represent displacement of one species by another? So where we're seeing differences in increases and decreases? Oh. It's, sorry, so is that in relation to, you? so is it a distributional change or are we seeing declines, actual declines? I think it's probably a question about at sites where we might have some species increasing and some decreasing. Okay, so, um, again, that's it's it's a tough question to ask uh, and, and a tough question to answer. Um, 
and, and annual data, especially as we get more annual data. So that starts to build a picture up for us. But for some of these sites, we only get one count every 10, 15 years. Uh, and so that those types of questions start to become quite difficult to, to pull apart. Um, it could well be displacement and, and it, there's kind of no way of knowing that unless you have real kind of fine scale data or on a yearly basis. So these, these censuses are really good at giving us context and understanding distributional change over a long, over kind of big stretches of, of time. But those annual data are where we start to really pick it up and uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of annual data from your area. So if you want to pick some annual data up and help us out with those questions, that'd be really useful. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we've got time for one more um, from Laura Goodhead. Do you know if there are any or many colonies of orcs that disappeared in the southwest since Seabed 2000? Oh, I might have written this down. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> if anything, I think that they they've they've picked new sites. So I think we're going to get, we're going to see some interesting new colonies rather than disappearances. We've definitely seen, so the black headicles, they've um, actually out of those eight sites, only four are being used now. So even though we've seen an increase, only four colonies are actually seeing that. And, and that might be indicative of other species, although they're very different in their, in their own respects. But from what I remember from looking at the data, there was very little zeros for the orcs. Um, and in fact, I think we'll probably see a trend more in new colonies popping up. And it's similar to what we've seen in um, southwest Scotland. So we're seeing these kind of new pop populations popping up and colonies popping up along there for the orcs as well. So it's a really interesting time. And I think the census is going to show some very, some very interesting trends for these species especially. Great, thanks Daisy, you're gonna have to move on, but no, um, no problem. if you have a look at the Q&A. I'll, Q &A, keep, I think yeah, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so next we've got um, Jo Morton from Exeter University, who's going to talk about her work tracking oyster catchers on the X. Hi Jo, over to you. Hi. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you for having me talk today. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter and the work that I'm presenting is um, a collaborative effort with Natural England and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. And so just a brief bit of background into oyster or Eurasian oyster catchers. They're widely distributed across Europe and in some parts of their range, they're fully migratory and within the UK, they are partial migrants. So on this map on the right, any areas in green, you could potentially see oyster catchers year round and in the yellow are just where there's summer visitors. So they have been declining for a number of years and have recently been uplisted to near threatened by the IUCN red list and across Europe, they're considered vulnerable. They are unique amongst waders in that they open the shelves of their prey and only eat the flesh inside whereas other waders eat the entire organism and you can actually infer the methods that the oyster catcher uses to do so by its bill shape so blunt billed oyster catchers they tend to hammer into the side of the shelves and once they have a hole they'll sever the adductor muscles and those are the muscles that hold the two shells together and then they can eat the organism that way. Uh, chisel build oyster catchers, their bills are a bit thinner and they search for slightly gaping shells in the mud and once they find one they'll insert their bill in the gap and access the prey that way. And then the final shape is pointed build oyster catchers. And these tend to probe a bit deeper into the mud and can be almost considered worm specialists. So they primarily feed on ragworms. The shape of one oyster catcher's bill, it, it can change throughout the oyster catcher's life, depending on the main prey that they're eating and the methods that they're using. So the site that we're monitoring is the X estuary. Um, we're looking at the overwintering population there. 
it's a very well protected site. It's internationally important because of the numbers of overwintering birds there and has been designated a triple SI since the late 80s and also a Ramsar site and an SBA since 1992. And the whole area is around eight and a half kilometres long and the SPA covers about 24 square kilometres. So within the X, one of the primary preys or the preferred preys of oyster catchers are mussels. But for a number of years, these have been declining and following some severe storms in 2014, the many mussel beds just essentially washed away. And as you can see from this latest IFCA report on the mussel stock assessment, there are almost no areas covered in mussel beds and the biomass is incredibly low of mussels within the X now. And as one of the preferred prey of oyster catchers, this is particularly concerning. So within the estuary, oyster catchers have been declining, which is a UK wide trend, but the decline has been more rapid in the X. So this figure is showing the annual wetland bird survey count data for the X, which is the top line in purple and a few estuaries that are nearby. And you can see that around the 90s or early 90s, with the exception of that one peak, there was generally around 4,000 oyster catchers overwintering in the X, but this has dropped to around 2,000 now. So the overall aim of this study was to try and unravel what might be the causes of this more dramatic decline within the X. Recent modelling studies have suggested that human disturbance within the X and also the levels of mussel harvesting that occur are not affecting the wintering population of oyster catchers. And so there's still a number of factors that this that could cause this problem. And although this population has been well studied historically, using biologging, we're for the first time able to consistently monitor the behaviour of individuals throughout the winter and seeing what they're doing throughout the whole period. So as part of this project, there are now around 300 oyster catchers in the estuary that have the colourings that you can see on the on the left. And any, reci any recitings are reported hopefully to the Devon and Cornwall Wader Ringing Group, and we'll be able to use these to look at, uh, to do some survival analyses. In addition to the colouring scheme, we also have 24 oyster catchers now that have GPS devices. And if you're ever in the field, you can identify these quite quickly because they have this additional blue ring on their left tarsus. And the GPS devices themselves weigh around seven grams, which is about 1.3% mass of an oyster catcher. And when that bird is within a couple of hundred meters of the base station, which you can see in the center, those data transmit to the base station. And then we can intermittently visit that station throughout the winter and download those data. So, the first tags were deployed in 2018 and 10, the 10 oyster catchers had tags throughout that winter. A further 11 were added in 2019 and last year another three were deployed. And these are split amongst the three different age classes. So the adult birds, although we can't tell their exact age, they're at least three years old. And then the sub adults haven't reached full maturity but they're at least a year old, and then the juveniles were tagged within the calendar year that they were caught. So the following data just that I'm going to present are just showing the first two years of tracking data. This work is ongoing and we're constantly collecting new data. So these maps are gonna be updated as we gather more. So in this map, you can see the SPA boundary in, in blue, and the majority of locations are within the protected area. But there are some individuals that are traveling outside the estuary. There are some that are going down to the team towards the south and others that are traveling up the coast and foraging in coastal locations towards Sidmouth. So this is interesting because 
most of the modelling assumes that oyster catchers remain within the X throughout the winter period, but with the tracking data, we can see that they're going elsewhere. Now, what this map is showing is a utilisation distribution, which you can think of as like a home range of these tagged oyster catchers. So it's showing the smallest possible area where you're likely to have a 90 or 50% probability of encountering those oyster catchers that are tagged. So you can see that it covers most of the SPA area, but also areas outside. But what's really interesting, when we break this down into age class, there's a bit of a different picture. So the adult birds have a much smaller area that they're using. They tend to stick south of Limpston and also remain within the SBA, whereas the sub-adults go much further afield. They're more likely to explore outside the protected area and also using almost the entirety of the SBA. So they they're essentially having to work harder to meet their daily energy requirements and they're also less likely to be within the protected area. Now as this is a long-lived species, um, they can live to be about 20 or so years old on average with the oldest I think is about 41 years old recorded, so it's the sub-adults who may have to be working harder and they are the ones obviously that are going to be joining the breeding population at some point so this could potentially be a problem so i also mentioned a third age class juveniles um we only managed to tag one juvenile in 2018 that was 6m and 6m stuck is pretty much to the top of the estuary and behaved quite differently to all of the other birds in 2019, we caught and captured a second one, um, AJ, which behaved much more like an adult and just stayed south of Limpston. But thankfully, obviously, with a sample size of two, you, it's hard to infer anything, but three more were added this, oh, sorry, last year. And we're now starting to build a better picture of what the juveniles are doing. And from these data that we've collected so far, you can see that they're, that they're behaving a little bit more like the sub-adults, they're going to areas outside the estuary and also using the majority of the SBA. Now, as I mentioned, these are a partially migratory species. So obviously the X isn't where they spend their whole life. And so we have to also look outside the X as to where potential factors may be that are affecting them. So we have currently got 21 birds that we have summer data for. Unfortunately, eight of those tags didn't continue, so we don't know where they went. They didn't transmit their data when they returned. Five of these birds remained within the X estuary, which was expected because they're, they're sub-adults, they've not joined the breeding population yet, but hopefully, because their tags are still working, as time goes on, we'll be able to see when they mature, where they go to breed. We also had one last summer who was a sub-adult and it went on a few exploratory trips. It, it didn't remain anywhere long enough to suggest that it was breeding, but it visited areas or sites in South Wales and it also crossed, crossed the Irish Sea and went to a few sites there. So this August, maybe we'll see if it picked one of these sites to breed and we'll have a better understanding of what it might have been doing. And that leaves us with seven birds that we do have migration data for. And these went to, well, three of them went east towards the Netherlands and the others all traveled north. One only made it as far as Manchester and the other three kept going and went to various Scottish islands. And this, uh, corresponds with ringing recovery data. Um, so in this map, you can see various ring recoveries from birds that were captured in Devon as a whole, so not just the X, but the whole county, and where these rings were recovered since the 60s. And there are plenty of ring recoveries in the Netherlands and also in Scotland, but there also going even potentially further, there's some up in Norway, Iceland, and even one over in Greenland. So 
the overwintering population in the X are breeding in a variety of different places. And in order to conserve the species or this population, we, we need to take a holistic approach and think not of the X in isolation, but also where are they going during the summer? And so using these tracking data, we should be able to clearly identify where important breeding sites are. And so the future directions of this, this work, we, we're still collecting data. We're um, going to collect data from this winter and analyze those juveniles and also hopefully get some more migration data towards the end of this summer and just keep going as long as the tags still work. We're also going to start looking at some survival analyses now that there have been a few years of ring recoveries. So we'll be able to see their overwinter survival and also their return rate to the X. Um, they're quite a site faithful species, so they should use the same breeding and overwintering locations throughout their life. And then also hopefully build a better understanding of the levels of protection afforded at the various different breeding sites that they are visiting. Um, so there's been a huge number of people involved in collecting all of the field site data and so thank you to all of them and thank you for listening if, if you have any questions and please go ahead. Thank you very much Joe. really interesting stuff. Uh, we have got some questions uh, already. So one from Vicky Heaney. Do you find an even spread of the different feeding methods to share food resources within an area? And do you see more pointed bills now that there are less mussels in the X? So one of the other elements of the work that we're doing is trying to build a picture of the distribution of prey in the X. And from the, what we've seen, in the north of the estuary, there tends to be fewer mussels and cockles and more sort of ragworm foraging. And in terms of the bill shape, um, in those images, it was really nice and easy to see the difference. But in the field, it's much harder, I think, to identify um, their bill shape down the scope. But um, we're trying to build a picture of how they're foraging as well with field observations. We've got quite a few University of Exeter project students have been out the last couple of winters doing that kind of work. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that in the future. Thank you, Joe. Um, question from Keith Hiscock. I explained to students that the limpet shells with large round holes in the top are ones that have been attacked or penetrated by oyster catchers and the holes have been enlarged by erosion. Uh, then you can frighten the children by gripping the limpet shells in your eye sockets or spectacles. Is Keith correct? Um, I, it, they could be, but they could also, I've recently learned of uh, a top shell that can also um, make holes in other shellfish. So it could also be that potentially, but I'm not sure on that. Okay, thank you. Um, question from James Stewart. You showed some really nice density plots of home ranges. For the wintering adult home ranges, do you know how much the overall size of the home range is dictated by within versus between individual movements? I.e. does the overall home range reflect individuals staying in small areas distributed across the X or do individual adults range across the site? Um, yeah, so one of the I don't want to go too much into the statistics, but one of the problems with kernel density analysis is obviously you're grouping a bunch of or well, a, a number of different animals and assuming each location is independent, whereas they're obviously not entirely independent. And that unfortunately is how we're still doing kernel density estimations. But when you look at, I have got them looking at individuals and in general, the adult do have a much much smaller home range some have even smaller than that area shown um, the actual figures are the 50 percent home range of the adults is around four square kilometers compared to 12 and a half of of the sub adults so it is quite a big discrepancy okay thank you joe and we have one more question from Liam Langley. Hi, Liam. Did you quantify the bill types of tracked birds? And have you looked for spatial partitioning within the estuary 
based on bill morphology in addition to the age or are the sample sizes too small? Um, so I have looked in, we've also quantified the various biometrics. We have their head bill length as well and their wing length and their mass. And with the sample size we have, there's no correlation with the distances that they're traveling. Um, so I, I don't know if that's just a sample size a problem or if it just doesn't seem to have any relevance because the, the, the distances that they go, the ones that forage far, are still not huge. Obviously, the whole estuary is eight and a half kilometres long, so it's not a massive distance for them to travel. So I don't know if the bill, oh, sorry, the wing morphology, for example, have a big impact on that. Thanks. So there's time for one more question from Tom Hutchinson. Is there any evidence of invasive Pacific oysters impact? Uh, sorry, is there any evidence that invasive Pacific oysters impact mussel populations in the X and T estuaries? And does that have implications for oyster catchers? So there are a number of Pacific oyster reefs that are now developed in the X. Um, and there is issues where the sprat of mussels have a harder time settling when there's a Pacific oyster reef. And generally, oyster catchers don't eat the Pacific oysters, but there have been a few incident, incidences where we've seen them eat Pacific oysters. So there are some individuals that seem able to cope with the Pacific oyster. But yes, they are impacting the ability of mussels to recolonize certain areas. OK, thank you. Be handy if they did develop a specialism for Pacific oysters. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Joe. We'll move on to the next talk. Uh, which is me and and Jesse. Are you there, Jesse? Yeah. Hello. I can see you. All right. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So, Jesse and I are here today to talk to you about Balearic shearwater distribution and abundance. And uh, this is a, a true multi partner project. So, uh, Jesse's from the Oxford Navigation Group at the University of Oxford. And when I'm not organising conferences, I work for Natural England. But um, on this project, we collaborated with RSPB, Marine Life, Bangor University, and CFAS. This work has just recently been published as a paper. Um, in Ecology and Evolution, that's an open access journal. So if you want to find out more about what we're talking about today, then uh, you can you can get that from that um, from that journal. And we'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of our co-authors for all of their input into the paper um, that we're going to summarise for you today. So we're talking about Balearic shearwaters, that, that's that beautiful bird on the left there. It's the only globally critically endangered seabird in Europe because of its declining population and some estimates suggest that it may go extinct within the next 30 or 40 years without action. As its name suggests, it breeds in the Balearic Islands in the Mediterranean and spends its breeding season foraging around the Mediterranean up to the coast of France and Spain and Northern Africa. And then in late May or early June, when it's finished breeding, all of the birds fly west out of the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Atlantic. And their non-breeding distribution traditionally, as this map from 2011 suggests, includes the coast of Portugal and Spain up into the Bay of Biscay, and then increasingly in the waters of the UK. Um, this estimate from 2011 suggests that was principally limited to the English Channel, but um, as our work will show, that's, that's probably not the case. The birds have been increasing in number in the UK uh, since the early 90s and some of that is from projects like the Sea Watch Southwest project which uh, had many volunteers on headlands around the southwest recording passage of seabirds and marine mammals. And that work was summarised by this paper by um, Jones et al in 2014 so you can see that in the spring there are occasional sightings of Balearic shearwaters, but then into the summer months, many more sighted around the coasts of northern France and increasingly into 
uh, southwest of England. That persists through into the autumn before numbers dwindle again into the uh, into the winter. So we know from from that work and from associated work that um, the birds are present. We know something about their passage, but we know next to nothing about what they do when they're actually at sea. And the paper, uh, the figure at the bottom from the same paper summarizes some data collected by marine life, which, which kind of reinforces that pattern. Um, not only do we have quite a sporadic data in the English Channel, we don't really have anything on the uh, west coast of Cornwall or North Devon. In 2019, JNCC had a look at all of the Balearic Shearwater data they could find in the European Seabirds at Sea database. And similar sort of pattern really for the at sea data. There's a smattering of observations in the English Channel, but again, not really very much in the Bristol Channel. Um, interestingly, birds recorded as far north as Scotland and as far west as off the west coast of Ireland. So there's a data gap, or well, there was a data gap uh, in our knowledge about the distribution of the birds when they are at sea. And um, CFAS ran a project called Peltic, which was looking at the pelagic environment, as it suggests there, anything um, from phytoplankton up to fin whales, and obviously that includes seabirds along the way. So uh, CFAS partnered with Marine Life, and so Marine Life put one surveyor onto CFAS's cruises to record data on marine mammals and seabirds. And in 2015, Natural England was able to fund an additional surveyor for marine life on the CFAS endeavour. So we had two observers in three of the years of this study and one observer on board in uh, two years of the study, so five years in total. And the aim of collecting the um, shearwater data along with the other environmental data and biological data that CFAS were collecting was to try and fill that evidence gap in our knowledge of Balearic shearwaters. And the beauty of being able to partner with um, CFAS and marine life is that all of those data are being collected at the same time. And so we can use our environmental and biological data to predict uh, why Balearic shearwaters are present where they're observed and try and use that information to uh, make predictions about areas we haven't surveyed. The maps on the right show the area surveyed uh, across, the, across the project and the green dotted area is the area we make predictions about distribution. As I mentioned, five years of boat surveys uh, between 2013 and 2017. The transects were uh, five kilometres apart. All of the data were collected either in October or in very late September. And observers were searching about a kilometre from the boat for marine mammals and seabirds. The boat did an average of about 10 knots on these cruises. And there were various sea states across, uh, across the survey period, ranging from flat calm to pretty much gale force, I think, at times. Um, as I said, the data being collected were both for birds and for environmental characteristics. And all of that has gone into the models, which Jesse will talk us through. Uh, the idea is that we find out what's driving the presence of Balearic shearwaters and having that relationship, use that to predict where we should find Balearic shearwaters. So Jesse, I'll pass to you. And if you'd let me know when you want to advance the slide, I will. Thanks. Um, so as Alex said, we use a spatial modeling approach to understand the distribution of Balearic shearwaters across our area of interest. So this is kind of an example of how this works. So the white circle encloses our area of interest. The blue lines are the transects that the boats travel on. Um, so as you can see, it would be really hard for the boat to actually cover the entire area. So um, we divide this area into a series of one kilometer grid cells. And in each grid cell, we know whether birds were seen or not. And we can also use remote sense environmental data, such as chlorophyll level, sea surface temperature, to understand the relationship between where birds are sighted and the levels of various environmental variables. And using those relationships, we can predict um, the presence of Balearic shearwaters across the area. Um, next slide, please. So we looked at both oceanographic variables and fish abundance variables. So the um, CFAS's vessel surveyed um, seven fish species, horse mackerel, mackerel, sprat, sardines, herring, anchovy, and boarfish. Um, so these 
uh, fish abundance variables were collected at the same time as uh, observers were recording the numbers of valuric shearwaters. Um, but we also were able to get data on large scale oceanographic features available online that were that were collected through remote sensing. So these include sea floor slope, sea surface temperature, ocean depth, salinity, maximum current speed, the distance to the coast, chlorophyll levels, stratification, anomalies, and roughness uh, of the sea floor. So one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to investigate whether fish abundances were better predictors of where Belyaric shearwaters are, or if oceanographic variables were better predictors of where um, uh, Belyaric shearwaters are. Next slide, please. So we used two methods to model their distribution. Uh, one of them was generalized additive models. And so the way generalized additive models work, they're a type of generalized linear models. And on the left, you can see a linear fit to this data. And the right is a fit using a generalized additive model. So what they can do is instead of fitting a linear relationship with from the response variable to the predictor variable, they can fit uh, the, the response, they can fit a smooth curve um, to the res uh, to the predictor variable. So it allows a lot more flexibility in terms of how we can use the data and we aren't constrained to um, linear relationships. Um, so it is a widely used method in modeling the distribution of seabirds. Um, next slide, please. But we were also interested in trying one of the newer approaches. So random forest is a machine learning approach and I'll briefly talk you through how random forests work. So if you imagine our data on in a data table where one column is Belyaric shearwaters, presence or absence, and the other columns are our environmental variables such as sea floor depth, chlorophyll levels, sea surface temperature. So what random forests do are they first take a random sample of two thirds of all of the data. Then we have 17 variables in total. So they randomly select four of those 17 variables. And out of those four variables, they find the variable and the variable value that can divide the data into presence and absence in the best way. So they wanna create the greatest difference in terms of presence and absence in the two groups it creates. So in this example of a decision tree, we divide the data at first using a chlorophyll of level of two. So um, half the, the, a part of the data is all the, all the data where the chlorophyll level is above two and the rest is all the data with the chlorophyll level below two. And then at, for each of these groups of data, it then randomly selects four variables from the 17 variables and from those four variables finds uh, the best split again. And it does this until each subgroup is all present or all absent. So this would be a decision tree. And so the random forest, it grows 500 deci decision trees. And it's called a random forest because it's a forest of decision trees, but also the selection of two thirds of data at, for, to grow each tree is random. And also the four um, variables used to split each node are also random. So after each, all the trees are grown, each tree then uses this decision tree to make predictions for the one third of the data it didn't use to grow these tree. And this one third of these predictions across all the trees are average to generate the prediction of the random forest. And so on the right, we have the variable importance ranking produced by the random forest. And so it shows that oceanographic variables or stronger predictors of Belyaric shearwater presence than fish abundance variables. And we also found with a generalized additive model, the oceanographic models were much stronger than the fish abundance models. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we, uh, after uh, figuring out which variables were the strongest predictors and identifying oceanographic variables were better, we had to map the, their distribution across the area. So as fish abundance variables were collected on the boats, but we didn't have an even spread, like we didn't have fish abundance across our whole area of interest, we could only use oceanographic variables for making these predictive maps. Um, so we identified the best map, a uh, best model using by selecting the model with the lowest AIC for the generalized additive model. And as you can see here, um, and the black dots are the areas where Belyaric shearwaters were seen from the boat transects. Um, so this is, it shows um, 
uh, uh, area of high probability of presence at the Celtic seafront. And you can see here the scale of probability of presence goes up to 0.25. Um, next slide, please. So this is the model generated by the random forest model. And it also picks up this area at the Celtic seafront, um, but there's a lot other, a lot like there's a, it predicts more areas of high abundance and on the scale it goes up to 0.8, whereas the generalized additive model goes up to 0.25. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. In addition to making predictive maps of the probability of presence, we also estimated abundance across this area because those maps, they weren't maps of abundance, they were maps of probability of presence. And um, previously, Opal et al. 2012 found, um, they tr attempted five methods, including generalized additive models and random forest models, and found none of the models were good at estimating abundance for Balearic shearwaters. And one of the reasons is there's um, a lot of zeros, zero sightings in our data. Also, um, the, the, the structure of the, and there are a lot of low numbers, so it makes it not great for mapping abundance, but we can estimate abundance across the whole area, even though we can't produce maps showing um, highlight like area hotspots for abundance. So we estimated the abundance by looking at the abundance within 300 meters of the boat transect for each year and extrapolating that up to the area of interest. So we have quite a bit of variability between years. Um, so the numbers range from 2% to 23% of the global population for this area. Jesse, thank you. So to conclude, um, so we do have differences, quite big differences between those two models, as Jesse was describing, but there does seem to be a consistent area within both models, which is pulled out as um, more likely to be uh, a probability of presence for Balearic Shearwater in that Celtic seafront to the west of Lundy. And just to stress, all the observations were collected in October. So uh, there is a kind of temporal aspect that these models perhaps don't encapsulate. Uh, two to 23% of a non-breeding population, obviously for a globally critically endangered species, even 2% of that population is significant. Uh, so it does, it does suggest that the UK holds a, a pretty uh, significant proportion of, of that non-breeding population. Some parallel tracking work from Jesse's colleagues at the University of Oxford suggests that um, most of the adult breeding Balearic shearwaters have actually returned to breeding sites at the time that these Peltic surveys were taking place. And so it gives us some evidence that the birds that are being detected around the coasts of the southwest are likely non-breeding individuals. So that could be either uh, adults who are on a sabbatical or it could be sexually immature birds which haven't yet reached breeding age. And that would fit with what we know about seabirds in general, where younger birds tend to range wider um, before they return to their, their breeding colonies. We also, as Jesse said, had quite a lot of uh, variation between years that could be related to things like weather patterns. So th there's a possibility that prevailing winds push more birds up from France in certain years. Um, but also there potentially is that, that temporal component I mentioned interannually. And so although we think this is the best understanding we've got of Balearic shearwater distribution at sea, we do need to consider other initiatives like the Sea Watch Southwest programme and like some work that I know Mark Darliston has been doing um, around the coast of England to, to understand how the birds are using the whole area around the southwest across the whole of the non-breeding season. What does it mean for Balearic shearwaters? Well, as I said at the start, they're globally critically endangered. We know some of the pressures are in the uh, breeding range, so we know there's issues of predation and disturbance in some of the Balearic Islands. But we also know that uh, long-lining bycatch is a huge issue for Balearic shearwaters, particularly within the Mediterranean. Obviously, we don't have any long lining in this part of the Atlantic and the English Channel, but um, we need to check that there are not potentially other pressures acting on Balearic shearwaters, potentially including other types of fishing activity. That's kind of the next step to understand what we should do, but there is a kind of mechanism for that insight. So in 2020 at Coastal Futures, Rebecca Powell at DEFRA announced this uh, England seabird conservation strategy. And so it will be interesting to see what develops within that strategy in terms of Balearic Shearwater. And we'll finish there with that um, beautiful picture from one of our co-authors, Tom Brereton. Thank you.
Okay, we have some questions. So, um, Jesse, I'll, I'll kind of fire them at you if, if they're if they're more about modelling and stuff like that. So the first one is from, from Bob Earl. What are the Balearic shearwaters feeding on? I think you, I'll have a go. You can contribute uh, anything you like. We, we think, Bob, I mean, obviously they're feeding on small fish. We think there's a possibility. In fact, there's some, some um, research in the literature which suggests that there is a link between increasing numbers of things like anchovies and sardines in the southwest which potentially could explain some of the changes in Valley Rich Shearwater sightings around the southwest. Now that's there's some some kind of contention around around whether that's um, how proven that is, but that is one suggestion that they are the reason we're seeing more of them is that they're eating more of those fish which are occurring more and more frequently around the southwest. Don't know if you've got anything to add, Jesse. No, I think that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, question from Peter Miller. Do you think the shelf sea fronts may be a presence factor for the Balearic shearwater? Some other seabirds appear to use fronts for foraging. Do you want to have a look at that one, Jesse, in terms of the modelling? Um, so a number of the area we identified um, is at the Celtic sea front. That's the area that both of the models picked up. So it's, um, I'd say it's, it's likely that they do utilise um, fronts. Yeah, and that's borne out by um, some of the other research, I think, from James Waggett and his team as well. So that, that would be in some ways expected, I think. Um, question from, oh, sorry, my thing just jumped around. Uh, question from Liam Porter. Is the Balearic Shearwater population in the UK likely to become substantial enough to form a qualifying feature of any SPAs? And do we think the offshore development, e.g. offshore wind in the southwest region of the UK, poses a significant threat? Uh, so I can have a go answering that. Um, Regarding SPAs, I don't know is the answer. So SPA is obviously one uh, mechanism of conservation. It's not the only one. And um, I think we have to do more to understand the differences in the model and also that temporal component of use in English waters. I think in some ways, the second question is perhaps the way to approach it. So what are the pressures that we think could affect Balearic shearwaters? So obviously uh, gill nesting is one in particular that we probably want to look at. In terms of offshore wind, currently, analog species like Manx shearwater are considered to be fairly uh, tolerant of offshore wind development. So they don't tend to present much of a collision risk because of their flight behavior. And they don't seem to really be displaced as far as we know in large numbers. So I think there's, there's obviously lots of unknowns around how Balearic shearwaters would react to offshore wind farms. But I would say that um, from what we know about, about similar species, they may not be as vulnerable as some others. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Mark Darliston. Hi, Mark. So as the survey data has a bias around October and misses out what's happening earlier in the season in the southwest waters, uh, the use of Lime Bay tends to be earlier in the season and Mark's finding large numbers now arriving during July. Traditionally, it was August in the last two years, including a new national record of 1,068 on the 4th of July in 2020. So is there a plan to repeat surveys earlier in the season? Uh, again, I, I can answer it, Jesse and Chippin, if you want to. So, yeah, you're right, Mark, that um, the data are restricted to that period. And so when we are considering what these models are telling us, I think we do have to bear in mind that um, the observations are all based at that time of year and the models could look different. But I think, you know, one of the beauties of spatial modelling is you're trying to understand the relationships between the bird's presence and what's driving them to be there. And so if those things are consistent over the non-breeding season, then we might expect, um, perhaps particularly the random forest model, to be indicative of what we might see if we were able to collect data throughout the season, um, in the non-breeding season. I think at present, the Peltic surveys have to take place at that time for their primary purpose, which is to, to do the pelagic fish monitoring. So I don't think there's any plans to change the survey window, but obviously in an ideal world, it would be good if we could collect more data across the non-breeding season. Um, and I think we've got one more. Okay, one from um, Joris Labory. How many individuals winter in England each year? Do we have an estimation of that? Or is it very complicated and variable from year to year? Uh, so yeah, Jesse presented some of the abundance estimates we were able to make from the data that we have. 
but in reference to the previous response, I think to Mark's question, that is obviously only based on observations that are made within the survey period, which was which was October or very late September. So we don't know whether that represents the whole of the non-breeding population throughout the entire non-breeding season, but there is a suggestion, as, as Mark kind of suggests, that there is movement within the non-breeding season throughout, um, throughout the summer and autumn. So it could be there is one population which is mobile, in which case we may not have estimated it too badly. I'm going to leave it there because we're running about five minutes over. So we'll try and answer the other questions that we didn't pick up, pick up through the Q&A. Um, but thank you very much for all the people who submitted those. OK, we're on to the final session now, which is going to be led by Mark Grantham um, with some other local experts reporting on their areas to tell us about what happened in the very unusual 2020 season. Over to you, Mark. Yeah, Grant, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have the unenviable task of uh, trying to fit five different uh, presentations uh, covering records from the entire Southwest region uh, over a whole year into 20 minutes. So uh, uh, if I just share my screen here. Um, so what, what I want to do, I've, in, in my slides from Cornwall, which we'll start off with, I've kind of put way too much information in. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll flick through them and I'll maybe pick out some highlights from individual slides. Um, and basically we'll look at um, some of the very, very basic summaries and maximum counts of some species. Um, and then we'll, um, then we'll go on to look at what, what very little sort of standardized breeding data we managed to get in 2020. Uh, so I won't mention every species that's on these slides, but uh, it'll, uh, all those records will be available in the report at the end, so I'll just um, blast through really. So I'm going to do it kind of uh, systematically really, so uh, just looking back through something like th through the divers, so looking at maximum counts, and uh, to, to put them into some kind of context, uh, red photo diver was a pretty, uh, a pretty sort of standard year really, uh, nothing exceptional numbers wise. Black throated diver, um, a, count of, a maximum count of 24 is actually really, really low, uh, and the count in the, the second winter period uh, was much lower than that. And we, we'd normally be expecting uh, upwards of 40, 50, um, counts of 40, 50 plus uh, black throated divers uh, over the winter. So to not have those counts in either of the winter periods was, uh, well, was quite unusual. Great Northern Diver, uh, that, that maximum count is pretty much um, similar to what it would be um, on average. Uh, Mounts Baby in the key site again, as it is in, the, in previous years. Um, there will be a few rarities in these slides as well, and, and the issue with seabirds, these are quite often uh, seen by, you know, perhaps one, two, a very small number of observers, some may be Cornish, uh, some may be Cornish birders, some may not be, some may be visiting. Um, so all of these are purely just reports that have been received. Um, very few of these records are actually officially submitted uh, to the bird club. So they, they effectively, they don't come to the bird club, which means they don't go to British Birds Rarities Committee. So, so really they don't, they're not accepted records. And that's a, that's a huge problem uh, in, in our seabird recording. Not seabird recording of the commoner species, but of the scarcities and rarities. Uh, the records often aren't properly submitted uh, and, and for rarities, they're definitely not properly documented. So these are records that just go by the wayside. So things like white billed diver, yes, you know, we have a description of that. So that is a record that, that perhaps will make it into the official record. Uh, Pacific diver has obviously been one of the highlights for a lot of people, although it's becoming less of a highlight now, uh, just because the, the regular returning bird, which came to Mounts Bay, uh, was the bird that first arrived here in um, March 2007. Uh, so it's, its habits are remarkably similar. So it's, it's tempting to think that it's actually the same bird uh, that's been returning for the past 15 years. Uh, and the timing of its arrival and departure is remarkably similar as well. So it's probably uh, the same uh, returning bird which comes to the winter. Although interestingly, there was this second uh, record, a flyby record of a juvenile uh, from a boat in Mounts Bay on the 6th of December. So, uh, and, and since then, we've had 
occasional records of Pacific diver elsewhere within, uh, within Cornwall, which might suggest that there are numerous uh, wintering birds in the area. This may have been going on for a while, but Pacific diver is one of those birds that perhaps uh, people are just getting their eye in a bit. People know what to look out for. So uh, they're actually being better recorded than they, uh, than they used to be. Uh, a few high counts. So um, our counts of sooty shearwater and, and balearic shearwater are actually lower than in previous years, and, and particularly balearic shearwater, you know, the, the maximum count for the year of 158 was remarkably low, and we'd be expecting, uh, you know, maximum day counts of four, five, six hundred. Uh, again, this could be a COVID-related uh, issue that without people, uh, without people out there sea watching as regular as they might, that's that's not. Uh, that's not going to be a very um, uh, a very accurate reflection of the year, I'm sure. Um, the big story over recent years as well was uh, the occurrence of brown boobies in uh, in uh, the uh, eastern Atlantic, um, and we had again several reports during 2020, and um, yeah, very few of these have been submitted. I think I think of these. I think the, the two off Porth Kerner have been submitted, but we're not sure about the rest. So again, if these birds aren't submitted with descriptions, who knows? Uh, but yeah, that, that run of records of, um, of brown booby continued into 2020, and it's a species that does seem to be turning up more often. Uh, accounts of uh, big shearwaters, uh, again, included, um, so again, a few of our seabirds had strange um, uh, winter records, very much out of season records, and again, a great shearwater in February uh, is quite a remarkable record. Um, but again, very small counts uh, for great shearwater, a second winter bird uh, in, in November as well was quite unusual and notable. Uh, on to gulls, uh, a few interesting scare skulls. There was a, um, a regular Bonaparte skull on the Camel Estuary uh, into February, which was uh, it's a bit elusive at times, but it was recorded by quite a few different people through its uh, through its stay. Um, and ring-billed gull is another sort of iconic species, I suppose, that's linked to Cornwall with uh, uh, the first record coming from from Cornwall many many years ago. Um, and we have a regular returning adult that's on Hale Estuary again. Uh, it was on Hale Estuary in both winter periods in 2020. Uh, but also a first winter on the salubrious location of Helston Boating Lake uh, in January as well. Uh, a few other oddities. Uh, Ross's gull is a species that a lot of people would like to be catching up with, but uh, yeah, a single bird on a single date uh, was only seen by a single observer. So again, uh, unfortunately, I think that's a record we don't have full details of yet. Uh, so whether that will be officially accepted, we don't know. Um, Mediterranean gull, uh, huge, huge gatherings now, and I think that reflects what's happening along, you know, elsewhere along the south coast. So, first winter, we first winter period um, had a maximum count of just 130 on on the Helford River, and that will be on um, uh, Gillen Creek, which is uh, effectively in the the southern edge of the mouth of the Helford. Uh, but then the second winter period uh, through autumn into winter, very, very large counts on the camel estuary. Uh, and these were birds mostly perched up on um, oyster rafts, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and you see the peak count there, 600 on the 8th of August. That, that's, you know, that's triple what we've seen in previous years uh, in the county. A run of, um, again, another species that's probably picked up more and more, another group of species picked up more and more as people become more uh, confident of identification features is things like Caspian gull, yellow leg gull, uh, American herring gull. Um, but, but we are increasingly seeing Caspian gulls here, and this is evident from colouring records as well, that uh, although the colouring effort hasn't changed too much on the continent, uh, we're seeing colouring birds in Cornwall much more frequently. So on, on top of increased kind of awareness of identification, it is, it is an actual increase in, uh, in numbers of birds as well. Uh, a few, the odd, the odd um, wintering sandwich turn, a uh, single Caspian turn, Pascal Drevi had, uh, again, not reported officially to the county. Uh, and then it's quite nice that we had um, a small group of uh, roseate terns. Uh, interestingly, uh, none of them were ringed, which does make you wonder where they're coming from, that maybe they're not British birds. So a small group of uh, roseate terns that hung around Coverack for a while um, were, were quite obliging. 
Uh, I won't say much about the skewers, although the Arctic skewer um, number is quite interesting. That there's, there's, we've seen this in recent years. There's a real double peak of records with uh, birds in April, which pres we presume are passage birds. Uh, but then rather than having a peak in autumn, we have a peak effectively in late summer uh, into June and the start of July. So whether these are wandering non-breeding birds uh, or failed breeders moving, uh, moving back south and west, uh, we're not quite sure. But that, that does appear to be a sort of uh, a trend in recent years. Uh, a few interesting petrels, uh, no exceptional large counts of any storm petrel, leech petrel, uh, but lots and lots of uh, Wilson's petrels, which again, people might be more aware of these species. And I think given the limited effort in, uh, in, in 2020, I'm sure you know, there are a lot more birds present than those records reflect. A couple of oddities, so um, bandrumped petrel, uh, bandrumped storm petrel, which is what people would have probably originally called Madeiran storm petrel, is a strange complex of of, um, of nine different um, taxa that can really only be identified from uh, vocalizations. We can infer identification from molt patterns, but you know, if these birds aren't seen close and photographed, there's, there's no hope of uh, of identifying this kind of this group of species to an individual uh, uh, taxa. Uh, but that that bird was seen on a couple of dates, and you know the description is very good. It has been submitted, so it looks like a you know very genuine record. Um, similarly, albatrosses, uh, black browed albatross, is a difficult bird to mistake, and um, yeah, two two records in 2020 was was quite exceptional. Uh, I'll put the numbers of orcs up, but I won't. I won't go through these because there's nothing really exceptional on the top uh, few species. But puffin, uh, the record of over a thousand past Porthgar on the 17th of March uh, was probably a weather-related uh, movement because these aren't local breeding birds. So whether these were birds, yeah, just pushed in closer to the coast uh, on, on spring migration, it's about the right time for that. So you know, but a thousand is. Uh, we very rarely get counts over 500, so 1,000 is quite exceptional. Uh, and then I just threw in some interesting pictures for species that people uh, might not be familiar with. Obviously, everyone's familiar with Puffin, but a nice black guillemot, very obliging black guillemot from, uh, from Newlyn Harbour uh, in 2020, pleased the photographers. Uh, and some of our regular rafting Puffins off, uh, off the malls. Um, so grey phalarope is another interesting one. So um, a, a count of eight off Pendine on two dates in uh, in October was again weather related that some very stormy weather pushed these birds very, very close in. So uh, that was quite notable, uh, including this one that met a very, um, a very sad end. So this is a uh, juvenile peregrine that uh, came into land and was photographed, uh, seen to take a grey phalarope off the surface of the sea. Uh, bring it into the cliffs to uh, to to eat. Going on to um, the breeding records, sadly we, we don't have much breeding data from Lew Island because the very standardised surveys of, uh, of, of of counts of nests of gulls, um, cormorants, and uh, fulmers oyster catchers uh, couldn't really be completed in 2020 due to COVID. Mullin Island, we we were able to do incomplete counts, but. Um, so our count of 59 great blackback gull nests was the lowest for quite a few years, but there were parts of the island that we couldn't access uh, due to there being late breeding attempts by cormorants. So uh, we didn't manage to survey the whole island, so it's not very um, accurate. Uh, but the, the very low survival through to fledging continued. So of the 146 eggs and chicks that we did manage to count, uh, only 14 large chicks were found on a ringing visit. So this is a, a visit to colouring chicks and only 14 were found. And that kind of 10% figure is very, uh, uh, is very normal for, for recent years. So yeah, that mortality rate uh, over the early chick rearing um, is, is absolutely incredible. Uh, good numbers of cormorants. So the highest that we've seen on the island, again, we couldn't get over to monitor them at the right time of year. By the time we could have got over, uh, chicks were too big to uh, to access the island, so uh, we managed to monitor them by taking photographs from a very long distance away. So between 50, 50, uh, 53 and 57 nests was the highest that we have seen, so hopefully we'll have a better shot this year at a, at a proper count. 
Kitty Wakes, I mean, we've met, people have mentioned Kitty Wakes already, and uh, Daisy did, and I think if we look back at Seabird's, um, Seabird 2000, there were 13 active Kitty Wake sites in Cornwall. Uh, if we're looking at um, 2020, uh, we had just three. So Porthmisson and uh, Western Cove uh, both had reasonable numbers of chicks, although you'll see from the 148 monitored, mapped to monitored nests at Western Cove, uh, 43 failed uh, and only 66 successfully fledged young. And that's a really high rate. And I know that was reflected at Port Mission where large chunks of the, uh, of the colony failed. And I think Trawlvis Head uh, has a very strange history. So there's two core areas of the, uh, of the site and they both failed again uh, in 2020. But there's a, a third site which um, is frequented by a lot of young birds, birds we've ringed as chicks in previous years or birds ringed as chicks in France uh, that are colouring. So we know the age of these birds and those younger birds have moved to a, a slight different location uh, further down the coast and they, they were successful but but yeah, only having 11 nests uh, successful out of 40 is still pretty dire. To answer your question from earlier, Sarah, yeah, the um, so some birds uh, will almost be classed as failed breeders from Trawbus. So we had two colouringed birds from Trawbus that were present in the Trawbus head colony in June. Um, so, but then by July, both of those birds had um, had moved to France, and that's quite often the case. We've had it the other way around as well that failed breeders will move from sites and go prospecting other sites um, through the um, through the remainder of the summer. So just some bridge pictures at the end. This is, uh, these are the Western Cove um, Portreath Kittiwakes, which is why we don't do any colouring in there. They're rather inaccessible, uh, so we don't do much there. Uh, and this is one of the very sad sites of the year. So this is this good and bad in the same photo here. Uh, the good is there are three Kittiwakes in a, uh, uh, in a, a you know, a, a remarkably high brood. We very rarely see three in a nest, uh, but you'll notice every other nest on that ledge is empty. Uh, the reason being that so the site parts of the site suffer really really serious um, peregrine predation through uh, through the season so we do lose lots of chicks uh, through uh, through peregrines so that's my whistle stop tour of um, Cornwall done so I will hand over to Vicky who's going to talk about Arzacelli Are you there, Vicky? Jack, are you able to unmute Vicky's line? Unmute. There I am. Hey, there we go. Hey, thank you very much. Now you want to uh, navigate slides, Vicky. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So uh, yeah, just a quick roundup from Scilly. Um, still one of the most um, important seabird sites for the southwest. The big count in 2015-16 showed that we've got just over 8,000 breeding pairs of 13 different species. So we're just behind Lundy now with their big increase in um, shearwaters for, for the amount of seabirds breeding here. But um, first slide, just the same as everywhere else, sadly, a lot of declines, I'm afraid. So this is, this is a lovely picture. It doesn't look like this anymore, unfortunately. This is from 2006 when we had 266 pairs of kitty wakes across the islands. Um, we've seen a steady decline and failure in 10 of the last 15 years and 2020 was no different. So we had just 15 pairs now trying and tried in 2020. And um, by the time I actually managed to get to the site to look in July, they'd all failed. So no chicks at all um, for, for kitty wakes. And turns, it's a similar-ish story. We've got, uh, we had 78 pairs in 2006. And in 2020, although some turned up and there was possibly a bit of um, courtship feeding, no confirmed sites. So it's three years now since we've had a confirmed breeding attempt by common terms. Uh, next slide. So it's slightly better with the uh, lesser black back gulls. So this is a 
key species for Scilly is part of our SPA designation, international, internationally important numbers. Uh, we have about two and a half thousand breeding pairs of, of lesser blackbacks across Scilly. And there's a stud colony on the island of Gu that I study each year. And there's about 400 pairs there. Um, obviously with COVID, I couldn't actually get there to, to get a, a good number of good estimation of breeding numbers. But by the time I got there in July, uh, there was a lot of chicks. So it seemed that they'd had a reasonably good year. Um, the exciting thing for 2021, we're gonna try and use drones. So we're, we're slightly behind the curve on that, but we are gonna have drones to um, help us in our, on our counts for next year and uh, compare that with the uh, traditional walkthrough counts that we've been using up to now and see see how those those compare uh, next slide so silly is really important for the borough nesters so it's the manx shear waters and the storm petrels only here and lundy where they're breeding within the southwest uh, the spa survey in 2015-16 showed we have over 500 pairs of Manx shear waters breeding on the islands now and that they've seen an increase uh, a pretty good increase in the last few years um our big project was the rat removal on St Agnes and Gew in the winters of 2013-14 and since then we've seen a great response with 17 pairs just on St Agnes and Gew increasing to 70 pairs just since since that removal and from no chicks up to between 40 and 50 a year um, this year we don't actually have any inspection burrows to get ideas of fledging success but we, what we do record is the number of uh, large chicks exploring on the surface after dark so in the last few weeks of their their fledging period in um, august and september the chicks will come out and check check out the area around their burrow maybe do some stargazing potentially but on the darker nights when they're safe from gull predation there's not enough moonlight for them to be seen that's when they come out and we do walks um, out around the colonies and sort of see how many chicks we can find in those months and we found up to 40 or 50 like i say this year we only encountered uh 30 chicks but i think what was going on was that was a limitation of our method in that it was a very it was a long spell of clear nights and big moon and the, the chicks just weren't spending time on the surface and chatting to um greg morgan on ramsey he found the same so from his burrows he was able to see that the uh, success was was average but he didn't encounter as many chicks on the surface. Uh, for storm petrels, our other key species, we've got about 1,300 pairs, and they're mostly over the outer rocks and islets where rats can't be supported. And so even if they get there, they don't survive. Um, and they have returned to breed also on St. Agnes and Gew. And this is a video, actually, hopefully this works, I'm not sure. We're looking at that, that video slide. So we've got a little video of, um, so from a, from a tight uh, camera that, that's motion sense um, triggered and it has uh, a chick, basically you can just see a little bit of fluff and it does it, it does a bit of flapping and then, then stumbles off into the bushes. But uh, it's very exciting because it's a chick fledging from uh, late August actually, so quite early chick. We've had some breed, some issues with uh, cat predation at that place because it's a domestic so there's, there's a resident population with pets. So we're working with a cat scarer um, and, and working with local population to address that. And in 2021, we're hoping to do a bit more night survey stuff to get some ideas of some of the other sites where these birds might be breeding because storm petrels can breed absolutely anywhere and trying to survey a huge area of potential habitats pretty hard. So we're going to use a bit of night vision to sort of see where the birds, the adults might be flying around in the dark to get an idea of where to um, direct our surveys next year in the daytime. So that's kind of a quick run through um, as elsewhere, reduced effort in 2020, but big plans for 2021. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Vicky. Uh, we'll crack straight on if my uh... Yep, my computer will let me. Uh, yeah, do you want to uh, unmute uh, Dean, who's going to talk to us about Lundy? Yeah. Hi there, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, yep, yeah, we can. Yep. 
Oh, magic. Um, so yeah, um, quick run through from uh, Lundy from last year as well. Um, I sh might just need to ask you just to ch change slides for me if that's okay. Um, so yeah, next slide please. Um, so yeah, the year started off really well. Um, we had some nice records throughout the winter. Um, we actually had record counts of red-throated divers. Um, um, yeah, last year, foraging and roosting along the East Coast, we had a max of 28 birds on January 24th. Um, we also had some small numbers of Great Northern Diver as well, which is um, quite usual for the islands. Um, we also saw some really good counts of kittiwakes throughout the winter. Um, There's a max of 2,770 birds um, at the end of January, which is quite good for the winter. Um, and also some really good numbers of Mediterranean gull as well. So we had a max of 14 on the 25th. So this is a species that's becoming much more uh, common around Lundy's waters now in, in recent years. Um, we also had a couple of little gulls as well, which is surprisingly really quite rare bird for Lundy. Uh, so it's actually just the eighth and ninth record for the islands. Um, some number, oh, yeah, small numbers of glaucus gull as well um, and single black-throated diver were also highlights throughout the winter. Um, we also then saw the first Manx shearwaters offshore um, on February the 16th um, and the first puffins arrived on the Cliffs and Jennies on the 11th as well and obviously the ox and the gulls were kind of uh, arriving periodically um, throughout the winter as well. Uh, next slide please. Um, so yeah, we didn't get to do the, the well, it's our full kind of island counts are done every four years um, with the help of the RSPV. Um, but I did manage to get out and do myself um, to try and count some of the seabirds around the coasts. Um, we did get some really good numbers of ox, um, particularly the gilly moths and razor bills. Um, and the puffins have been doing really well as well. Um, yeah, especially considering, you know, we just, we only had five birds um, in 2005. Um, obviously, you know, from the rats and all the other reasons where we, we nearly lost the puffins altogether on the island. Um, Kitty wake numbers were up. Um, from the last few years, actually, which was quite promising. Um, and Jeff yeah, Fulmer's great black back goals um, were, well, just kind of average. We had a pretty decent year. Um, but again, yeah, our herring goals and lesser black back numbers uh, uh, received, saw decreases as well. Um, so, yeah, particularly in the last, what, 20 odd years, I think we've seen about 70% decrease um, in our herring and lesser black back goals on the island. Um, yeah, which is quite worrying. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, uh, with the full count um, coming up this year with the RSPV, we'll see increases in those again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, obviously, you know, with coronavirus um, and despite the lockdown, um, which we, you know, normally get volunteers to come over and help with our seabird productivity monitoring, um, with the help of some of the islanders, um, which is really good, um, we actually managed to do our productivity monitoring last year as usual. Um, so yeah, we, we studied um, four different species over five sites in 2020. Um, so yeah, I'll run through some of those now. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, the guillemots, um, it's an area called St. Mark's um, that we, we survey them. They had a very good year actually. Um, so yeah, 165 chicks um, fledged from 217 attempts. Um, so that's actually a record for that site. Um, which has been monitored for productivity since um, 2013. Um, yeah, so very good year for those guys. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but yeah, one really interesting Guillemot observation we had last year was of this colouringed individual, um, 0114, um, which was in Jenny's Cove. Um, we actually found out that this was a bird that was ringed as a nestling in 2013 um, on Skummer. Um, and yeah, after correspondence with Tim Burkhead, um, we actually find that, you know, the movements um, of birds and uh, actually having birds nest anywhere else other than their natal colony is really quite unusual. Um, so yeah, this is quite a significant find. Um, and yeah, it actually raised um, uh, and su successfully raised a chick last year in Jenny's Cove, which was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, we're very much looking forward to seeing that bird again this year. Next slide, please. Um, puffins um, had, um, well, quite a poor year uh, when you compare it to everyone else, but um, particularly on Lundy as well, it's with, with the cliffs being so inaccessible in the areas which they breed, um, they really are quite difficult to, to survey here. Um, but regardless of that, we actually did have a record number of chicks 
um, fledge from the site. Um, so yeah, 133 from 216 apparently occupied burrows um, in Jenny's Cove. Um, next slide, please. Um, and our kittywigs, um, again, it's quite poor, but, um, you know, it's actually quite, uh, it, was, well, it was very good actually compared to the last few years. Um, so we actually saw an increase in the number of nests um, on over two sites on the island, um, in area Aztec Bay and three quarter of all buttress, and actually an increase in the number of chicks that managed to fledge from that site as well. Um, so the, yeah, the reason that that most of the, the well, some of the nests field anyway, there, there were some big kind of storms in through June. Um, so yeah, some of the sites are really quite vulnerable to st strong southwesterlies. Um, and we did lose a couple of nests kind of lower down on the colonies due to those storms. Um, we did see some predation as well from lesser blackback gulls um, and then uh, some great blackback gulls later in the year as well. But um, we think as well because peregrines, which sometimes um, hunt in through that area, we didn't actually see them predating any birds last year. So uh, potentially uh, peregrines, the lack of peregrines in the area um, actually did them well. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, our Fulmers um, had a, a fairly average year on Gannett's Rock as well. So yeah, 15 chicks fledged from 36 attempts. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we um, spent quite a bit of time up on the north end of the island, um, catching and ringing these beautiful little birds. Um, so yeah, the European storm petrels. Um, so yeah, unbelievably, um, the first confirmed breeding record of these birds was in 2014. So the young chick that was found down on the western slopes um, during a ringing session for Manx Shear Waters there. Um, historically, you know, we believe that they have nested on island previous um, to that date, obviously. But um, you know, Lundy being Lundy, most of the island is very inaccessible um, along the cliffs. So um, yeah, very hard to survey these birds here. Um, but in 2017, when I arrived, I found a little colony on the north end of the island. Um, and we did some surveys with the RSPB in 2019. Um, and we estimated that there was about 10, 20 pairs nesting on that colony there um, using tape back, playback call um, surveys. Um, but this year we caught over 79 birds and most of those were actually caught without tape blurs. Um, and a lot of them were had extensive brood patches, you know, some of them with full crops as well. Um, so we, potentially, yeah, the colony is actually a little bit larger than um, we actually thought um, by using the tape playback call work. So, um, yeah, that's, hopefully that colony is just going to keep um, growing and growing. Um, and in the years to come, we will be catching many more birds up there. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, Manx Shear Waters, we didn't do a full island count last year. Um, I think the next one is planned for 2023. Um, but uh, we do have a number of uh, Manxie nest boxes along the, the west coast. Um, they were only put in about four years ago and gradually they're being uptaken um, more and more so each year. Um, so I think they had eight birds uh, or eight pairs in boxes this year. Um, which was up two pairs from last year. So it's nice we can actually get in to see how the chicks develop. Um, and even with a very, very small sample size, um, get an idea of um, how productive some of these birds are. Um, so yeah, only two, two of the eight pairs, I think, field last year. And fingers crossed as the Manx Shear water population uh, continues to increase in number um, since the eradication of rats on the island. Um, we'll see an increased uptake in these boxes and yeah, we'll be able to study the birds in much more detail uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, um, we had lots of fantastic sightings throughout the autumn as well. Uh, well, late summer, autumn, um, a bridal turn on the 26th of August. Um, which, well, if accepted, will be the second record uh, for the island falling a bird in 1977. So yeah, that was a very, very special surprise uh, during a, an, um, an afternoon sea watch on the East Coast. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, on the same day, we had um, Lundy's fifth sea bind skull as well. So yeah, quite an unusual bird. Um, it was actually this bird that drew me to the bridal turn. Um, so yeah, it was two Lundy rarities um, in the same scope, which was really, really nice. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, Lundy saw its uh, seventh great crested grebe as well on the 7th of August, um, found by Jimmy Dunning 
um, just off Rat Island um, as he was actually leaving the island uh, of the Obsession 2. So yeah, fantastic record. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, we saw an influx of um, yellow-legged gulls, juvenile le le yellow-legged gulls in August. Um, so I think prior to last year, there might have only been one official or accepted record of yellow-legged gull for the island. Um, the picture here actually is of um, a, a gull I find, um, a second calendar year gull, sorry, um, that I find in the winter, but I think we had seven or eight records of juveniles um, throughout the late summer as well, which is, yeah, really exciting. Next record, please. Uh, next slide. Um, but yeah, probably one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting record of the year um, was a white-tailed sea eagle, um, which was what well, flew over the head of Tim Jones and Tim Davis um, in Acklands Moor on October 16th. Um, and yeah, this is the first white-tailed eagle to be seen on Lundy in over 140 years. Um, and yeah, it was luckily it was one of the satellite tag birds um, from the Isle of Wight reintroduction scheme. And yeah, it flew over the island and actually spent a bit of time on the north end of the island, just below the lighthouse, um, before um, coming back up the island. And it's actually not shown here on the diagram, but it actually made a quick trip to the Devon uh, mainland, came back again, um, providing spectacular views. You can see from this um, photograph here that I took on the east coast um, before flying back to Heartland Point. Um, so yeah, really exciting and fingers crossed, you know, we're going to see much more of these birds in the upcoming years as well. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, you can follow all the Lundy bird sightings. Um, it's up, the blog is updated um, relatively frequently um, and covers pretty much the whole year. So if you want to see bird, uh, you know, what's going on wildlife wise on the island, please do log on to the Lundy bird site. Um, it's not just the birds, it's wildlife, uh, so marine, other marine sightings that we put on there from cetaceans to bluefin tuna to intertidal stuff. Um, and yeah, obviously lots of wonderful migrants and rarities as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much. All the very best. Um, I hope everyone is well and safe. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And uh... Yeah, I can imagine a sea watch where you see sab skull and uh, bridal turn on the same <laughs> on the same sea watch in the same scope view is just a bit mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, incredible. <laughs> right, if we can uh, unmute uh, Ruth now, I think Ruth's going to talk to us about uh, straight point, which we debated earlier whether it was actually straight or not. But there we go. Are you there, Ruth? Hopefully somewhere. Yeah, I think you're unmuted, Ruth. Try that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, oh, brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, um, Ruth Porter. Um, I just uh, monitor a, a kitty bait colony in South Devon, um, Straight Point, Exmouth, uh, where I live. Um, and um, for the last three years, I, I've picked up um, monitoring the breeding success of this colony uh, with Alex Banks. Um, and we also do a count um, each year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, I just thought I'd give a quick summary of the counts and the, the productivity from this site. Um, so it's actually remained fairly stable in uh, count. Uh, so you can see from uh, 2000, there were 155 apparently occupied nests. Um, and then uh, for the last three years that um, Alex and I have been counting the site, um, it's been pretty consistent. But you can see in 2020, um, there were 251 um, apparently occupied nests. Um, and quite a sort of expansion of nests across the, the plots. Um, the 2019 count, um, I'm not entirely sort of confident on because it was a little bit early. Um, it's better to do it sort of in the June dates. Um, and then, yeah, the breeding success. Uh, so 2018 was a great year, the first year that I, I, I monitored the breeding success. Um, and then 2019 was also a very good year. Uh, 2020 was looking like a brilliant year. Um, and uh, on the 21st of June, um, I went down and um, did uh, a 
a breeding success uh, monitoring session um, and it was all looking brilliant there were lots of apparently um, sort of incubating birds uh, and then on the 4th of July I went back down and um, there were a lot of birds standing on um, empty nests so something had happened in that couple of weeks um, uh, quite a sort of widespread nest failure um, and you can see from the the three plots that I look at um, in 2020 that um, plot one and plot two really um, suffered um, and then plot three um, seemed to do okay uh, next slide please so um out of interest um because there'd been such a failure in 2020 i wanted to plot out um in the three years that i've been looking at the site um the the nests um and say so the green dots are successful fledging um nests the red dots are nest failures and then the yellow ones are trace nests um so um that's the look in uh, 2018 and then uh, next slide please 2019 um, the black dots are where birds haven't returned from previous year um, and then 2020 the next slide yeah um, you can see quite um, that failure of nests um, in 2020 um, uh, next slide please so um, one suspicion uh, might be the peregrine that I saw um, a few times um, when visiting the site um, it it was just standing there on that day that I went down and wanted, early on in the season. Um, obviously, we don't know what might have caused failure, but that that might have been one um, one suspicion. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping, obviously, that this year might be um, a bit better, more like the 2018-19 uh, seasons. Um, but we'll wait and see. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Can I, I'll, I'll just chip in, not quite a question, but just a couple of things for myself, because I saw it in the questions earlier that, yeah, I, I see that um, the whole thing with complete failure of a part of a colony, I think is, um, it is we've seen it quite often in Cornish colonies, and I do think it is predation. Yeah. And I answered a question earlier that I think what happens is there's a tipping point within colonies that if you have a very healthy, big, viable colony, then it's not worth a peregrine actually risking uh, injury by going into that colony. So big colonies survive. But I think as soon as colonies go beyond a certain there's a tipping point where the colony becomes too small or part of a colony becomes too small and it then becomes a little bit sort of safer for uh peregrines or ravens and things like that to yeah. come in and take chicks so once they've had one two three chicks then they'll have the whole lot you know i've yeah. seen peregrine clear out four nests in 45 minutes so i think that's probably what's happening yeah it did it did seem like that to me obviously i don't know for sure but um the fact that it was the plot one and plot two sort of nearest to that um where i saw that program there um it it you know sort of almost you know cleared out um and then the third plot which was further along um did quite well still and i did notice through plotting the nest that um the bird a lot of the nests that were successful were tucked back in in holes or in under ledges um and so yeah it felt like that to me but obviously can't say for sure yeah, uh, yeah. it's really disheartening to watch when you oh, know, i was gutted <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For interest, to put some of the numbers into perspective for people, so productivity of one 1.1 chicks per nest still isn't uh, high enough to maintain a viable population that you're really looking for 1.2, minimum of 1.2 chicks per nest uh, within a colony to maintain a viable population. Our Cornish birds are variable between 0.6 and 0.8, so we're way below that, uh, you know, so even high productivity of one 1.1 isn't enough to maintain the population yeah grand okay well thank you for that and then uh last but not least i think we have uh richard is going to talk to us about um dorset and chesil beach and things like that hi mark can you hear me yeah just shout when you want your slide or i could have it now please you know that would be useful i did a team thing about a month ago with somebody who talked for an hour and we couldn't communicate with them and uh, they blithely went on with it for an hour without um, anybody being able to hear a splendid presentation it was very tragic um, okay I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, some of our key seabird populations in Dorset we've got five 
um, key species. We've got sandwich tern, common tern, little tern, med gull, and black headed gull. Um, I'm the RSPB conservation officer covering Purbeck. Actually, I should in introduce myself. I'm also the project manager for the Chesil Little Turn Recovery Project. Um, I expect most people will know the layout of this part of Southern Dorset. Uh, I mean, if we go from east to west, uh, the first two black dots on the right are in Pool Harbour, as I'm sure people will know. Moving across then to the Weymouth area, we've got the little dot at the base of Weymouth, which is uh, referring to Lodmore. The one uh, right down by the road to Portland is the Chesil Beach Little Turn Colony site. And the one furthest left is the Abbotsbury Swannery. Um, so coming to Pool Harbour, uh, there's Brown Sea Island, the far right dot, which is owned by National Trust, um, managed by Dorset Wildlife Trust. It's the site of the Southwest only um, breeding sandwich tern colony. And last year there was 241 pairs. Um, there's a feeling that the colony has slightly declined over the last decade or two, but actually when you look at the records since 2009, they had 263 pairs, now 241, maybe a slight decline. Last year their, their productivity was about 0.67 chicks per pair fledged. Um, I don't know about sandwich turn. I know with Little Turn there was a really good paper in British Birds recently looking at uh, colouring recoveries. Um, and we still have quite a lot to learn about adult survival, first, second year survival. Uh, and we're gradually getting uh, bits of information around little turns. I don't know what it's like with sandwich turns, but I suspect if they like little turns, 0.67 is borderline sustainable. Um, I don't know whether they're doing any uh, food provisioning uh, research over there, but uh, uh, the sandwich turns are nesting on two small islands, two islands, I think, within Brown Sea Lagoon. Um, so that represents just under 2% of the UK breeding population of sandwich turns. So it's still a pretty, it's a pretty important uh, colony. Um, on Brown Sea, on the same lagoons, we've got common terns. They were 164 pairs last year. Um, again, productivity around 0.8, sustainable, possibly just about. Um, elsewhere in Pool Harbour, we've got the other black dot, which is the Med Gull colony, um, which is on a place called Giggers Island, which, are, which is a actually two low-lying islands just to the east of Wareham. Um, last year, there were 100, well, see, 2018, sorry, last visit, there were 155 apparently occupied nests. So this is becoming, again, um, an important seabird site within Pool Harbour. That's about six and a half percent of a rapidly growing UK breeding population. And in fact, last December in Weymouth, in Weymouth Bay, there was a gathering at roost of about 2000 med girls. So um, I'm sure most people know that this is a species on its up within the UK. It's doing pretty well. Um, the Giggers Island site in Pearl Harbor is interesting. Um, there's a lot of work happening around um, trying to offset the effects of sea level rise in Pool Harbour at the moment, largely driven by the need to protect the north bank of Pool Harbour, the property there from, um, well, the, the flood defences need repairing and obviously they're factoring in sea level rise. What isn't happening in the harbour is any account being taken of the um, coastal squeeze effect happening on undefended bits of coast like these offshore islands and the salt marsh, particularly on the south side of Pool Harbour. Um, it's an issue that I'm pretty concerned about and I've been trying to talk to my RSPB colleagues at HQ. Uh, from a policy point of view, DEFRA have said that they will look at offsetting coastal squeeze impacts on defended bits of coast, but they won't currently on undefended bits of coast. And if you look at Pool Harbour, the south side, there's a lot of salt marsh and um, a lot of natural frontage. Uh, and so I think we are concerned about, we need to see some sort of offset. Just south of where that Mediterranean gold colony is, the RSBB is involved with Environment Agency on this big Arne Moores managed realignment project. We hope to put in two lagoons on that site, uh, which between them should have several new uh, lagoon islands and we hope that uh, if we can put down the right substrates and protect the site from disturbance then we hope we'll get uh, colonization by maybe some of the sandwich terns, maybe some common terns, maybe some Mediterranean gulls. So I think um, 
you know, things are looking reasonably good in Poole Harbour for those species at the moment. If we go further west, we come to Lodmore. Um, that's an RSPB reserve where we have, again, we put in two small islands several years ago. Uh, it currently holds about 45 pairs of common terns. Uh, last year, they had a productivity of two, so two fledged chicks per pair, which is a very large number. Um, and that recent productivity success has partly been down to giving the terns greater protection from local herring gulls, putting out shelters um, and, and netting. And I think we need to expand that uh, that little area. There are two islands which are almost full to full to bursting. Uh, they also have something like 20 pairs of black headed gulls on on the islands. So um, a success story, but obviously relatively small scale. If we come down to uh, the neck of Weymouth to Porton, that's the little turn colony. Uh, I took over as project manager last year and of course we crashed straight into Covid so it was a very interesting time. Normally we appoint a project officer in the spring to, to manage the site. We weren't able to do that last year but we had a great group of volunteers who managed to keep the, the project going. Um, the site had a record number of little turns as well. We had 50 pairs we reckon of little turns, which is the highest number since about 1998 when we had 100 pairs. So A, the thing's going in the right direction, B, there's clearly uh, room for um, a significantly larger number of breeding pairs there and we're, we're hoping to take that forward. It is on common land so we're working with Natural England to try and get the right permissions. It has to go up to the Secretary of State in order to expand the electric fence area which is essential to keep out uh, kestrels. Last year we had a huge problem with hedgehogs, a hedgehog, a male hedgehog who over a period of about five, five nights took 93 eggs. I'm sort of chuckling, but it wasn't funny. Um, and it did set the colony back, a lot of birds relayed. Uh, and we reckon we had about 30 fledged young, which is about pro productivity of about 0.6, which is probably just under the bar. Um, but considering it was a COVID year and we had this unexpected hedgehog, um, I think it was, a, we did pretty well. We also managed this year to locate the Kestrel Nest, which is up on Portland Cliffs, on the West Cliffs there. And we devised a technique of, um, uh, with a sort of large rod fruit picking pole uh, of dispensing um, um, domestic fowl chicks to the Kestrels over a period of about 60 days. Um, it was about 16, 18 chicks per day. You can do the maths, I'm sure, quicker than I can. Um, all this says, of course, that, you know, to maintain a colony like the Little Terns, we have to do a hell of a lot of intensive work. Um, is that sustainable long term? I guess as long as collectively the RSPB and its partners have that commitment, we can. Um, but the colony remains very vulnerable, of course. And, you know, as with sandwich terns, these are, I guess, they're pioneer seabird species. They, 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 they colonise a site. They use it until it becomes unsuitable, e.g. you know the, the predators zone in on them and it, and it becomes unsustainable and then they move on. Um, we've effectively parked the population here and with it you know you get the effects of predators zoning in um, and of course we have issues like recreational disturbance to deal with as well. Uh, that's the little turns down at Chesil and then we've got the Abbotsbury, Abbotsbury Swannery, there's another common turn colony there um, there were about 55 uh, pairs last year, raising just under, uh, again, 1.6 chicks per pair. I'm not quite sure what the reserve do there in terms of protecting their little ter their common terns, but uh, clearly some pretty good um, productivity. Black-headed gulls, finally. Um, it is a species that seems to be doing pretty well in this area. Again, I'm looking at the figures in front of me. The Giggers Island, um, islands where the Mediterranean gulls nest on the on the west side of Pool Harbour that's got just under four and a half thousand pairs of black-headed gulls on it at the moment. Um, I can't remember the productivity but it's very high and at Lodmore where we had 20 pairs we had a productivity of three, 3.0, three, three chicks per, per pair. I think it's a species that's doing again it's doing really well in this area. Um, 
not sure what else I wanted to say. Clearly, these are these birds are part of wider meta populations. Um, we're doing color ringing, uh, have been doing color ringing over the last five years of the little turns through the life project, which finished in 2018. Um, we've aimed, this site, Lodmore, has been used as stopover from birds from uh, Kemlin, I think, in North Wales. And we know at least one of our color, color ringed little turns at Chesil has permanently moved to Denmark where it's now a breeder there. Um, we know also that Hailing Island, um, just east of Portsmouth, is an important stopover site for some of our little terns. I think if we get more money, it would be good to put GOS tags on them just to see, get clearer pictures of stopover sites, particularly on the south coast of England. Um, we know birds are using, uh, I think it's the Channel Islands, there's been sightings of colouring little terns on the Channel Islands. Again, if we get the money, uh, we'll do some work. Um, an interesting development with the Little Term project down at Chesil is that um, working with Dorset Council, Natural England have managed to secure permanent, semi-permanent funding for the project because of housing developments being proposed in Weymouth uh, and through this thing called the Community Infrastructure Levy, uh, a planning mechanism. Um, Dorset Council provide money to the project in order to help protect the colony from the increased recreational pressure anticipated as a result of the new houses. And these sorts of planning frameworks also exist within Pool Harbour and on the Dorset Heaths. So um, they're really good because the idea is to, pre to prevent any uh, um, adverse effects on these colonies. As an, in, as, as, as an incidental um, thing, we get the money to help um, sustain our input to the little turn colony which is good too um i think that's all i want to say mark brilliant yeah thanks for that and uh yeah i know little turns all too well having cut my teeth many many uh many many years ago uh, as a little term warden at gibraltar point bird observatory in lincolnshire so i know i know i know your stresses and your worries <laughs> Grand. Well, I think we've answered questions as we've gone along, actually, Alex. So unless yeah. um, anyone else has any and they want to raise their hand, um, then I think we'll probably good. I think we'll bring it to a close, Mark, and I'm really sorry we've overrun so badly. That's me being too ambitious with our agenda. But thanks for thanks for staying on the line, everybody. I hope you found today's stuff interesting. And thanks to all the speakers there. All of that stuff will be great for the 2020 report, which I'll be editing. If you do have any other information you want to contribute, then please email that to me uh, in the email that had the Zoom link, which brought you here today. For interest, the next, uh, next, next Southwestern Marine Ecosystem session is a week today on Friday the 26th on fish and turtles. But finally, I'd just like to say thank you again to all our speakers today for the SWME Organising Committee and the Marine Biological Association for hosting today's session. And thank you all for joining us, particularly those who shared your insights and questions during today's session. Thanks everybody and goodbye. <laughs>